all or nothing. You know, there's a personality type called all or nothing. And it may be true that I have aspects of an all or nothing personality type. And maybe you do, or perhaps you know people who do. An all or nothing personality is given to extremes. It's given to extremes of speech, extremes of behavior. Some of you maybe are all or nothing types of people. You're either going to eat no cookies or you're going to eat all the cookies, right? Either you're going to open one present or you want to open them all on Christmas Eve, right? All or nothing personality types. All or nothing, is that the personality type that we should read into the Apostle Paul or of the Gospel writers or of the Scriptures themselves that make such extreme Statements, statements like all or nothing statements, either you're in Christ or you're out. Statements like Christmas means everything or Christmas means nothing. Are we to just explain away such bold statements as personality types? Or is there such a thing as truth that demands that such statements be made and be heard and believed. What did the scripture writers mean when they used extreme language that demanded that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord? Christmas changes everything if it's true. And if it's not true... It changes nothing. It's mere feeling, as we heard about on Friday night in our Christmas Eve homily, if you were here. It's mere sentiment. It's mere opportunity to have festivity. But if it's true, if the Christ child really came, then history has been changed. People have been changed. Eternity has been changed. So Christmas changes everything or it changes nothing. And that is not a personality statement. That is a declaration of gospel truth. So how does Christmas change everything? Quite simply, we heard it in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, in our assurance of pardon. And that said this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a life-changing statement. That's a world-changing statement. Statement. That is why, if true, Christmas changes everything. Everything about our hopes, everything about our fears, everything about our future, everything about our week and every day of our life. It is redefined if Christmas is true. If Christmas is true, it changes everything. And if it's not true, then nothing is changed. Those of you who've seen the movie The Christmas Story remember that scene in the movie where the young boy has been hoping for a BB gun. You remember this. Uh, It's Christmas morn. It's time for the gifts to be open. And they've gone through what appears to have been all the gifts. And there was no BB gun given or received. Do you remember this? And then dad, as dads are prone to do, says, Oh, well, wait a minute. What's that over there behind the tree? Maybe there's just one more gift. You remember this? a sweet moment and sure enough sure enough dad came through he'd hidden the present so hearts went from being down to being very high well I want to have a moment like that with you this morning not that I'm your father but I do have what I'm going to call three Christmas gifts of the gospel for the day after Christmas okay Uh, Children, these are verbal gifts. (laughs) Your parents will explain these are gospel gifts to you. But those three gifts that are true because the gospel's true are these. It's confidence, it's power, and it's endurance. Christmas confidence, Christmas power, Christmas endurance. All because what God did in time and history and the sending of His Son was true. And it was real. So first, Christmas confidence. What do I mean by that? 
Two passages to consider. Romans chapter 8, verse 38, which we heard a moment ago. Listen to the confidence. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. That's Christmas confidence. That's boldness. That's strength of speech coming from a strength of faith. And then Philippians 1, 6, which we've also already heard. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it. That the God who has begun his redemptive work in you will see it through to the end. That's what I mean by Christmas confidence. That it is God who accomplishes his purposes in his people and in his church. It is a confidence that can overcome our changing feelings, our changing circumstances. It's the promise of truth over feelings, our feelings. So how is God at work? Excuse me, how are we confident? Number one, we are confident that God is at work. He says in his word, he is at work. How is he at work? Well, we're confident that God is at work in us, in his people. That's what his word says. And we're confident that God will complete that work that he has said he started. Those are the kinds of things we're told we can be confident in, that God is at work. He is at work in us, and he will finish what he starts It may be true of some of you, it's certainly true of me, Um, but I am one, just like my father before me, who will start a project, maybe get bored with it, leave the tools there, leave a mess there, and move on and maybe start another project. Some of you maybe are like that with books. You'll start a book, read a little bit of it, put it down, say, I'll come back to that, and then you start another book, another story right? There's something about us that doesn't always finish what we start. That's not true of the God of the Bible. God says that he finishes what he starts. He sees it through to completion. And he says that about his very redemptive work in every one of us. We can be confident that God is at work. He is at work in his people and he will finish what he starts. Amen? Amen. We can be confident, not in our abilities, but in His. So you know that for years I worked with college students in ministry. And each year um, I would have an event that brought guys and girls together. And it would be a, a learning event for them and a playful event with food and hospitality uh, where they would tell each other Uh, their frustrations with the other. And I know that sounds to some of you like a terrible idea. Just trust me that it was a beautiful event. It was great. We called it a brawl, but it was playfully done. But most years, the girls would tell the guys in some form something that sounded like this. The girls would say to the college guys, we wish that you would be more confident in what you do. That you would be more committed to what you do. Now, of course, the guys are hearing this and they're the ones who show up to class in pajama bottoms, right, with unkempt hair. And they're just flying from one thing to the next. But the girls would challenge the guys and say, we wish that you would be more confident that your lack of confidence is unattractive to us. That stings a little bit to hear, doesn't it? Every guy's like cringing a little bit, but it's true. It's true. So how unattractive is it when Christians lack confidence? And when we lack confidence, I'm not talking about confidence in ourselves. Confidence in our God that he will be true to his word, that he really is at work in us and in our world, and that he will see his purposes through. You know, we prove that we're not very confident in our God when we wring our hands 
over the details that are out of our control in our lives. But we're a beautiful thing of confidence when we say, you know what, I don't like these details and circumstances so much, but I'm trusting the Lord to see these through for my good. I'm going to trust Him. In a bumpy road, in a difficult time, I'm going to put my trust in my faith. I'm going to put my confidence in Him and in His Word. Do you have that kind of confidence going into 2022? Who knows what 2022 is going to bring? We lived through 2020 and 2021. Didn't see that coming. Here comes 2022. Can you as a Christian walk into 2022 and say, you know what, don't know what's coming. But my confidence has always been in the Lord, in His purposes, in His seeing His promises through, and I trust that He knows what He's doing. I'll be faithful in my tasks and I'm trusting with him, trusting in him for the outcome. Do you have that kind of confidence? That's the kind of confidence God has told you you can have in this life. You can walk out the door Monday morning, not knowing what's coming, but saying, you know what? I know that my Redeemer lives and that he rules and he reigns and everything's going to ultimately be okay, though it may hurt a bit. It's going to be for my good. That's Christmas confidence. The child came. The Christ child came. He lived a perfect life. He was put to death by sinful men for it. But God raised him from the dead. And every one of us should have confidence in him if our faith is in Christ. Secondly, Christmas power is a gift given to us who have faith in in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And then Philippians chapter 3 verse 21a. By the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. There's a power available to Christians, but it's a peculiar power. It's not the kind of power that you and I immediately think of. It is a power in us and through us, but it's a power displayed through our weaknesses. It's not our power at work, it's God's power at work in us and through us. And God says of his own power, he is able to put everything under his control, under Christ's control. Well, who else would you want your life and its details to be at the hands of other than Christ himself? And God has said, that's a Christmas promise to us. Your life is in His hands. And He will use your weaknesses to demonstrate His power, His strength, and His might. It's a peculiar power. It's not the way that we saw power uh, being fulfilled. It's not the way maybe we would have chosen it. But there is no better way than to know that our sinful lives are in the powerful hands of a loving God who controls all circumstances for our good. That's a gift of Christmas. There's a hope to be had, a confidence in that kind of power that God has given to us. It is a capable power. It is a power that will see us through. It is the kind of power that can lift a sad soul and give him hope. Can you trust in that kind of power in 2022? Can you boast of your weaknesses as 2022 approaches. You, like me, can probably anticipate some things maybe that 22 will bring. And you, like me, could be overwhelmed by those. But it's through your weakness, it's through your frailty that God will demonstrate His power and bring success. So whatever it is, consider it in your mind. But God says He will show your weakness and show His power for His glory. And that's a good thing. It's a Christmas gift 
to us. That power of God at work in us, the scriptures speak of it as a, the power to justify sinners, the power to sanctify sinners, to change sinners. That's the power that God is doing in us and through us. And it's the power that you need. It may not have been the power that you wanted, but it's the power that you need. And then thirdly, third Christmas gift is the gift of what I'll call Christmas endurance. The ability to carry on and to finish. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 39 says, We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we persevere and are saved. In Philippians chapter 3, 21b, God will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. You see, there's a definite end coming for Christians. And God calls it glory. The scriptures speak of it as heaven. And God says He gives His people on their pilgrimage the faith that they need, the strength that they need to endure to the very end. However hard that pilgrimage may be, God will give a faith and a strength that can endure to the very end. And because that's true, that means put it all together and you have this. We can be confident in God's power at work ordering the steps of our lives until the very end of our lives. Therefore, we don't quit. We don't lose heart. And we don't shrink. We don't shrink in fear to anything. That's the nature of God at work in His people. A faith that will endure through the hardships of life, through the joys of life, to the very end of life. Those of you who are parents, you know, you've surely lived through, and if you've not, it's coming. Trying to teach your kids to not quit. If they start an instrument, you want them to learn that instrument. If they start a sport, you don't want them to quit in the middle of the season on their team. You don't want to create a culture of quitting. You don't want to create a culture of giving up. Because the Christian life is not one of quitting and giving up. It's one of enduring and persevering and living through, trusting God in all the circumstances that we endure. And I suppose God as our Heavenly Father is teaching us that same kind of lesson. That when things are difficult, when things are discouraging, we don't just quit and walk away. When marriages are difficult, we don't just quit and walk away. We engage more. We labor by faith. When relationships with friends sour, we shouldn't easily walk away. We don't just quit. But we're an enduring people by faith who seek to honor the character and nature of the God who has created us, the God who has redeemed us. So what might you be prone to want to quit in 2022? Maybe there are things you need to quit, some things you need to change. We'll talk about that next week. But are there things that you're prone to want to easily quit, easily give up on, easily walk away from, when you have the confidence and the power that you can endure by faith to the glory of God, to the very things he's called you to do with your hands, with your heart, and with your mind. I don't know. I don't know what it may be, but I expect there are a lot of things in this room. And I want to encourage us to not be a quitting people, but a people who endure by faith to the glory of God. When God's called us to do something, he's provided everything needed to get it done by faith. It won't be easy. It will require faith, but it can be done. You see, by faith, we as Christians, we believe that Christmas has really changed everything. We have a confidence, we have a power, we have an ability to endure that we would not have had apart from Christmas. 
But God has given it to us by His Word, by His Spirit, and in His Son. And so Christmas in that way has truly changed everything about the kind of people we are and about the ultimate eternity that we will spend. So what do you say? Is that just a personality type? Or do you believe those are gospel truths given to you to encourage you? The Christmas gift of confidence, of power, and of endurance. Those things belong to you if you're in Christ. And we're called to live by faith in Him who gives those things. Christmas truly means everything, or it means nothing at all. C.S. Lewis, in his own wisdom and in his own way, said a similar thing this way. He said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. But if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. So what say you about Christmas and the gifts of Christmas? Those real tangible gifts that God has given us. They're either true or they're not. They can't be partly true. Those are the gifts that God has given you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray that we would be a people who have faith to trust in the solid rock that is Jesus and his promises to his church. Let's pray. Father, that is our prayer, that with a new year approaching, you might work in us a confident faith that believes that you are at work empowering us to endure by faith and to your glory. So Lord, would you work that in all of us, young and old, that we would know what it is to apply these gifts of Christmas given to us in your Son through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. And may we find him to be the solid rock, the very solid rock of which we sing. And we pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen.